Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. It is so good to have you here. I know it's a bit gloomy outside and dreary and rainy and all of that, but inside, we have the Spirit of God at work. We have the love of God present among us. And above all, we have this amazing community. We want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter where you happen to be on life's journey, you are welcome here. Now we know that today is a day that many people are celebrating Mother's Day, and we know that this is sometimes a, a day fraught with emotion for some folks. Um, so we want to acknowledge both that there are reasons to celebrate today, and there may be reasons that people may be in, in grieving, uh, perhaps they didn't have the best relationship uh, with, with their mothers. And also, for those who never have had children, it doesn't mean you cannot still be a mother figure. So it's important for us to acknowledge the complexity of a day uh, like today, even as we also acknowledge this is the seventh and final Sunday in the season of Easter. And so we know that there needs to be more than one Sunday to celebrate the amazingness that is the resurrection. And today we get to celebrate it by acknowledging a very important event in the life of Jesus, his disciples, and all of us, the ascension of Christ. Now, there's something we love to affirm whenever we gather to worship, and that is God's goodness. God is good. All the time. God is good. And because you can't say God is good too often, let's do it again. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. 
amen and amen. And now our Deacon Judith is going to lead us in the responsive call to worship you'll find printed in your bulletin and also on the screen. Come, celebrate and give thanks, for God has done marvelous things. God makes a way where we least expect it, raising us from death into new life. Come sing and dance, for whenever we are troubled, worn out, lost, or confused, God shows up to help. We need not falter or grow weary, for God will not leave us comfortless. Come and worship the one whose love never fails. Alleluia. Let, Let us worship, worship God. God. Our opening hymn is in your bulletin on page 10, but you can certainly also follow along uh, with the words on the screen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to, to join in singing this hymn. All right, thank you. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession on page three. Gracious God, it can be hard to look and listen for your presence whenever it seems like you've left us to fend for ourselves. It's, it's often, often easier, easier to get, to get busy, busy doing, doing something, something 
than to pause, be still, and await your guidance. You call us to be your witnesses, letting our lives speak of your kingdom of radical love and restorative justice. Yet the shadows of hatred, fear, greed, and violence threaten to dim our light. When systemic injustice, discouragement, or exhaustion overwhelm us, have mercy on us. Send your spirit to revive and empower us. Give us the courage to continue Christ's ministry of healing what is broken. Help us to trust you will never leave us nor forsake us. Beloved people of God, hear this good news. Now, beloved people of God, hear this good news, and it's different from what's in your bulletin. Amidst our daily struggles and mistakes, God remains with us. God is always ready to offer us forgiveness and grace healing our hurts, setting us free from our fears, and blessing us with courage and love. Through Christ and the Holy Spirit, God continues to speak to us, giving us wisdom to meet the challenges we face, hope that shines in the night, and the power to resist hatred and injustice. And the people say, Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the letter to the Ephesians. And we're going to be uh, reading from Ephesians chapter one, verses 15 through 23. And if you turn in the back of your pew Bible, also known um, as the New Testament or the Second Testament, uh, to page 191, you can follow along with me. And the voices of the author of the letter to the Ephesians will be Deacon Judith and myself. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. What are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints? Did I just read your part? No, I didn't. I apologize, I did. <laughs> Go read my part now then. <laughs> <laughs> 
and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sealed him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body. The fullness of Christ who fills all in all. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Now our second lesson comes to us from the book of Acts. You need to be thinking of the Gospel of Luke as a two-part volume. And it's really, we like to think of it as Luke-Acts. And Acts is like the second volume of Luke. And uh, we're going to be reading from the very beginning of that book, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Uh, again, if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, uh, turn a little bit, uh, uh, we'll turn the pages to page 118 in the back of the Pew Bible in the Second Testament, also known as the New Testament, page 118. We're going to have a couple of people joining us on Zoom, as well as myself and Joe C. In the first book, The Elopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. Jesus said, this is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Our hymn of preparation is Lord Prepare Me, and we're singing this especially for the second verse. Uh, you can follow along in your bulletin on page 11, um, or other words on the screen. We're going to sing it through fully twice.
Well, during the 50-day season of Easter, we take an extended time to unpack the significance of Jesus' resurrection. We listen to the confusion and doubt that arose during Jesus' initial resurrection appearances to his disciples. We hear about the variety of ways that the risen Christ engages his disciples in conversation and reminds them of his teachings. And for the last three Sundays, we've looked at Jesus' pre-resurrection commandments to love one another and abide in his love as a branch abides in the vine. Now on this last Sunday in the season of Easter, we celebrate a departure that makes room for a new arrival. According to the author of Luke Acts, 40 days after that empty tomb and the discovery that Jesus is indeed risen, 40 days after that, Jesus lets his disciples know that he'll be leaving them to go and be with God. Now, only Luke Acts includes the story of Jesus ascending into heaven. For a long time, I thought this was simply a narrative explanation for why the risen Christ no longer shows up in a tactile and tangible way to his followers. I figured the ascension, which always seemed a bit like some kind of Hollywood-inspired special effect, was a creative way to orchestrate a spectacular exit fitting for one who overcame the death dealing power of the imperial domination system. But what if the ascension could be more than a creative narrative tool? As biblical commentator Michael Fitzpatrick puts it in his Journey with Jesus essay for this week, Quote, the ascension allows Jesus to be the center of all things, not just the center of Galilee. With the ascension, the risen Jesus is no longer bound by the limits of physical proximity or geography. Through the ascension, Christ can be found not just in Jerusalem, or on the road to Emmaus, or in an upper room, or by the shores of the Sea of Galilee, but wherever two or three are gathered in his name. See, the disciples need to undergo a transition from students to teachers, from apprentices to mentors, but first, Jesus tells them, they need to sit tight in Jerusalem and await the promise of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples, you may recall, ask a clarifying question that only reveal their confusion. They're like, okay, so does this mean that the promised kingdom of Israel is going to be restored because, you know, we're still confused on what Messiah is and how we think that that means, like somehow we're going to kick the Romans out of our area and that horrible oppression and the tyranny we have known will finally come to an end, that we're going to have a political situation that will be rectified by you, Jesus. Hey, so that must mean what you're talking about, right? Yeah, uh, that's not what Jesus actually meant. And Jesus says, mm -mm, that's not what I want you to focus on. Instead, focus on how you are going to receive power from the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses into an ever expanding geographic area. And then Jesus, the risen Christ, departs from their sight. Now at first the disciples seem a bit lost. They're staring up at the sky. What are they supposed to do now? And I don't blame them for that sense of uncertainty and trepidation. 
Most of us aren't particularly comfortable with uncertainty, and we don't really enjoy waiting, especially for something we're not quite sure what it's all about. Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit, and they're like, okay, I don't know what that's going to be. And when we are in that place of uncertainty, most of the time, it's a lot easier to make some sort of a plan, to create a list of some kind, to get to work on problem solving and making decisions, or, or just frankly get busy doing something, right? That's so much easier than it is to pause and to listen and be still and anticipate that maybe, just maybe, there is more that we need to hear and more that we need to receive before we move into action. The thing is, Jesus wants the disciples to be aware that he's not abandoning them. He will never leave nor forsake them, but he does want them to create within themselves a pause that creates the kind of rich, fertile soil for the life-giving power of God to spring up among them, for wisdom and revelation to emerge, and for hope to take root. And that's what ends up happening. They do hang out in Jerusalem, according to Luke Acts, for a period of time, and as we will celebrate next Sunday, in fact, the Holy Spirit does show up in some pretty powerful ways and helps them to move from that sense of uncertainty and questioning and not sure where to turn next or what to do next into a sense of empowerment and ability to do so much more. The hardest thing for us to do when we are faced with a conundrum in our lives is to pause and anticipate that the Holy Spirit will have something to say to us. We experienced that challenge not that long ago as a congregation last year when we were facing such difficult circumstances, at least projected to be difficult circumstances, with a very large projected budget deficit, a little bit over $70,000, a lot of people were caught up in feeling like, uh-oh, this might be the end. But some of us realized what we need to do is pause. Yes, we wanted to get busy paddling away on creating a solution, kind of like those ducks with their feet moving so rapidly under the water. But we also needed to be still for a little bit. We also needed to let the Spirit speak to us, and boy, did she ever. We'll be talking a little bit more about that next Sunday. But suffice it to say, this invitation to pause sometimes is really critical as faithful followers of Jesus. We need to not hesitate to do that especially when we're not quite sure where we're headed. But I also want to unpack the second thing that's so powerful in this story. Jesus telling his disciples, you will be my witnesses. What exactly does being Jesus' witnesses, what's that entail? You know, for some of us, when we hear this, we think, oh, shoot, does that mean we have to canvas the neighborhood? knocking on doors, telling people about the loving life, liberating teaches, transformative ministry, unjust death, and unstoppable resurrection of Jesus? If so, I do not want to sign up for that. But maybe it isn't always about speaking about our faith. Maybe it's as important for us to enact our faith for our actions to speak of the love we have known, for the community of, of inclusive diversity 
that Jesus creates almost effortlessly, drawing people into his presence that come from all economic backgrounds, that come from different social political persuasions. Remember, he had people who were dirt poor and worse, and he also had people who had status and money and power. He welcomed all of these folks together in order to create something beautiful, a community where everyone matters and everyone belongs. And not only that, he drew all those people together in order to show them the kind of world that they could live as though it were present already. That's why he was so focused on clothing the naked, healing the hurting, inviting all of his followers to share their resources, reminding them that the most important position any of them will take ever is in the back of the line, not at the front. And ensuring that those who all too often have been shut out get to come to the center. Maybe, just maybe, being Jesus' witnesses will include that we'll figure out a way to exercise the demons of hatred and fear that seem to have so much of our culture today in its grip. Maybe it means that we're going to call out the ultimate impotence of the principalities and powers that dominate and oppress us. Maybe, maybe it means we're going to say the gospel includes good news, not just for people who look a particular way or have a particular material goods or stand in particular positions of leadership, but maybe the gospel, the good news is for everyone, especially those who have been pushed aside, those who have been on the receiving end of insults and jeers, those who have been harmed by the folks in power. What if we were not just to imagine and dream of a world where everybody matters and belongs, but we were to act in our everyday lives as though that world were already here? What if we were to understand that bearing witness to the good news of Jesus is about resisting things like systemic racism, calling it out whenever we see it, even if that puts us in a place of making other people uncomfortable or even being uncomfortable ourselves. Maybe it also is about naming those false gospels that seem to be spread so prevalently, like white Christian nationalism that is far less about Christianity, far more about power for one particular group of people, white folks, and far more about some fabled, and I do mean fabled as in not true, past in which we were some kind of, so sorry about that, that woke you up, didn't it? in which we were some kind of nation where everybody thought a particular way and where in fact Christianity in their minds was used to justify things like the enslavement of people, to justify things like only white men of property could be able to make decisions. I know that recently I came across something that was quite upsetting to read, and that was a report on 
A recent action of the Russian Orthodox Church under their patriarch um, that seemed to be more about describing, unfortunately, not Christianity's goals, but the goals of empire. This was an edict that was adopted on March 27th of 2024, that was unanimously supported by 488 delegates, including more than 30 Russian Orthodox bishops and more than 60 Russian Orthodox church priests. It was something that the, their patriarch, oh, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, Kirill, Patriarch Kirill, yeah that he fully supported, sanctioned, and helped to author. And it consists of eight sections that concern the special military operation in Ukraine. Don't you love how people come up with all these fancy words to describe, which is actually a devastating, unjustified invasion of another country and war. And it also includes the Russian world, foreign policy, family, demographic and migration policy, education and upbringing, economic, special, and urban development. And what is the basis for all of this? Not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Nothing really in the Bible. In fact, they say in this edict, from a spiritual and moral standpoint, the special military operation is considered a holy war in which Russia and its people defending the unified spiritual space of holy Russia fulfill the mission of Ketakon, restrainer, protecting the world from onslaught of globalism and the victory of the West that has fallen into Satanism. Wow, if that's not a perversion of the gospel of Jesus, I'm not quite sure what is. In fact, if you read through this document, you will see alarming parallels with what came out of Germany in the 1930s and the way in which the National Socialists there used Christianity to put a veneer of respectability and appropriateness and justifiability on what ended up being horrific and monstrous and I would say completely evil beliefs and actions on their part. Not only that, but this statement said, The possibility of the existence of an independent Ukrainian state should be completely ruled out. And yet there are people who believe that this is legitimate. This is why Jesus needs us to be his witnesses speaking a different word a truly saving word, a liberating word, calling out that which is not of God, naming whatever is undermining our capacity to see the image of God in one another, to care for this incredible gift of a creation God has blessed us with, and, and to also ensure that everyone has the ability to thrive and flourish. In the meantime, while Jesus is no longer physically with us, he's got plenty of work for us to do. In the meantime, we can pause when we're unsure what to do next, when we're feeling overwhelmed by what seem like incredibly powerful forces at work in our world to undermine everything Jesus taught, preached, and demonstrated. We need to open ourselves 
to be ready to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that will revive our drooping spirits, that will empower us to go out and speak the word of goodness and truth amidst all the falsehoods being peddled as reality. A spirit who will give us a message of healing hope and restorative justice. A spirit who will give us the courage to resist and to persist. This is good news. The world is hurting and we are Christ's hands and feet now. No one else has the capacity as we do, as all of Jesus' followers do, to be out there blessing, healing, loving, lifting up the last and least, sharing, receiving each day with gratitude, and finding ways that we can make a difference. We are Christ's hands, Christ's feet, Christ's ability to speak good news. Thanks be to God, we're not alone in this. In fact, it's because we're all part of a wider body of Christ that we have the faith and the capacity to do so much more together than we could ever do alone. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we'll have an opportunity for those who are here in the sanctuary to share your joys and concerns. And for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, also uh, we'll have an opportunity to share your joys and concerns. In the meantime, let us be together in a spirit of prayer. Holy, loving, and life-giving God, we are in need of your spirit. We are in need of your inspiration and encouragement. There is so much in this world that is disheartening, that is life draining, that is the work not of goodness and love, but of hatred, of domination, of exploitation. And so God, we ask that you give us exactly what we need. You would equip us to be your witnesses in our daily interactions with other people and the choices that we make in the way that we spend our time and in the words that we say in all of these things, we might speak of a world where sharing by all means none go in need, a world in which every person has an opportunity to contribute their distinctive gifts and are appreciated for those gifts. Every creature, all the plants and animals, the birds of the air and the creatures in the sea and everything on land, that we would see these as sacred and that we would protect and care for these our kin. For this is what it means, God, to live as though we are part of the kingdom of God and that it is breaking through into our hurting, troubled world. Show us how to do this in such a time as this. God, in your mercy, 
God, we pray too for those who are working for justice, who are speaking out and stepping forward, who are actively making a difference in our community for the good. We pray this day for teachers and staff at all of our local schools, for their commitment, not only to our children's education, but to their well being. We pray for the people involved in SNUG and all the work that they do to mediate potential situations that could erupt in gun violence to offer a powerful vision of how there can be a different way to cope with one's sense of frustration, anger, and even deep discouragement. We pray for all who are involved in caring for our creation and for those who are at work and creating policies that will ameliorate the wrongs and the harms of climate change. God in your mercy. God, today we also give thanks for all of the mother figures in our lives, whether they're biologically connected to us or not, whether they're part of our family of origin or our family of choice. We thank you for the ways that these mother figures have encouraged and stood alongside us, who have called forth the, our best selves, who have offered that love that we need and who stand in our corners. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of their mothers, those who maybe never had a good relationship with their mother and those who may at different times in their lives feel ostracized or excluded because they never got to be a mother. And we pray, God, that you would help us to continue to find grace and meaning from relating to you, oh God, as our mother. God, in your mercy. We pray, too, for those who are struggling with addiction or, or depression or anxiety for those who know the ache of loneliness, who feel isolated, for those whose chronic pain is a constant companion, and for those who are dealing with health challenges, facing or trying to recover from surgery, and those who are mourning the loss of loved ones including Connie O, Marianne W, Sue C, the Cross family, Susan M, and Diane B. We also pray for Lee T, as she, as she prepares for cancer treatment. We pray for Betty A C, who had time in the hospital that she may recover. And we pray for Don and Peg T's son, Mark, and Peg's niece, Jeanette, for Julie D's mother and father, for Joe D and Jean C, for Karen H and Pat W, for Mary B's friend, Andrew L, for Alan C and his family, for Sue C's friend, Andrew, for all Ukrainian refugees and people who are doing their best to fight against 
an empire that wants to see their very being snuffed out including for Vitalia, Sasha, Evelina, and Adelina D. And we pray for Bob M, Mike S, Ha T, Don L, and Scott B. God in your mercy. And now uh, Deacon Judith and I will come to you in the congregation. Those who have joys or concerns to share, we invite you to raise your hand to do so. All right, I'd like to invite those who are joining us on Zoom. If you have a joy or concern you'd like to share, please do so. God, it is such a gift that we at all times, in all places, in all situations, we can turn to you. Whether we're able to articulate our needs or our sense of thanksgiving and joy, you still hear us. And so we gather up all of these different prayers, including those that are known only in the silence of our hearts, entrusting them to you because we know that your power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Thank you, God. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for the way that the Spirit is at work among us and within us. Help us now to find fresh new guidance and inspiration from those familiar words that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So one of the ways that we serve as Jesus' witnesses is that in a world where the language of scarcity is absolutely everywhere. And in fact, our consumerist culture thrives on trying to tell us that you don't have enough and you need more. But in fact, we realize we have things to share and we have enough. We each have enough in our own lives to make a powerful difference. And it's through the act of sharing that we bear witness to God's immeasurable love and in God's ongoing supplying of our every need. Our morning tithes and offerings to God will now be received.
would you please join with me in the prayer of dedication? You'll find it printed in your bulletin on page four and also displayed on the screen. Let us pray together. Life-giving God, we thank thanks for the gift of your presence and the courage, strength, and inspiration you provide us every day. Even when we face uncertainty or feel anxious, help us to grow in trust, love, gratitude, and joy. Bless the treasures we share. We dedicate our gifts and our lives to creating opportunities for your kingdom of justice and belonging to take root in our congregation, our neighborhoods, and our world. We pray in the name of the risen and ascended one, Jesus the Christ. Alleluia. Amen. Please be seated. We have some announcements. I think you're actually going to bring that back. Yeah, bring it back. I'll put it in there. Yeah. So first off, we have our anti-racist working group that's going to be this Tuesday. Correct? I did get the date right, I hope. Okay. <laughs> At 6 on Zoom. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to have a movie night on Friday, May 24th, and we're quite possibly going to be seeing the movie Barbie. Now, Tracy put in the um, announcement that, well, you know, we never did manage to see Ghostbusters, and who knows? It depends on who shows up and what they want to watch. But anyway, that's the tentative plan. Uh, Friday, May 24th, it includes dinner. Uh, but of course, you need to let Tracy know if you're planning on coming so he can figure out what, how much food we need to get and so forth. So please be in touch with Tracy in the church office if that's something you would like to be part of. Next slide. The Hospice Adult Bereavement Group uh, will have another meeting on Friday, May 24th. They just met this Friday at 3 in Swartz Parlor. That's just a heads up. Okay, next. Ooh, this is very important. The Poughkeepsie Pride Parade and Festival is coming up almost before you know it on Sunday, Saturday, excuse me, June 8th at noon. Now, there are lots of ways that all of you can participate. And by the way, it is essential that we have not only queer folks marching in pride, but straight folks, our fabulous allies, with us as well. So hopefully all of you will find ways that you can either march or ride in one of our vehicles to be part of that parade experience. Now, we need people who might be willing to bake cookies that we give away, who might be willing to set up or take down or staff our booths in Warriors Park. Uh, who, now, here's a really important thing. We need a pride coordinator who coordinates the volunteers. It doesn't mean you have to figure out a ton of stuff. We've got all kinds of things to help you out with that. And maybe you want to uh, contribute items for a gift basket. We found that was a fantastic thing last year, to have a raffle that would end up be a free giveaway. Nobody had to buy anything to purchase, but they did have to fill out a little form so that we could be in touch with them later and follow up and say how wonderful it was that you stopped by the booth. So having gift baskets is really important, and snacks and bottled water, it turns out, is really important too because we give all these things away for free. It's yet another way to create that opportunity to connect with people, far too many of whom have been marginalized, if not ostracized or condemned by Christianity. So this is really important. Next slide. Along, whoop, no. Along with that, we need you to order your church t-shirt. And we need to put in an order for uh, getting them by May 15th. There, will be, there is a sign-up sheet in um, Margaret Chapel that those who are physically here, you can sign up. But you can also call the church office. We now have both a front-sided and back-sided uh, t-shirt. You can see how it, uh, those are the two sides. I'm sorry, I had to, you know, put up a, a, a t-shirt to take a photo of, and it was wrinkly. But anyway, you get the point. The t-shirts are $15. You can get them anywhere from small to three extra large, whatever it is that you need. Please, please, please sign up for that. If you have any intention, not only of participating in Pride, but, next slide, if you might join our church in going out to the ball game. We're going to have a, a, a wonderful church night of our folks 
uh, going to the Renegades, Hudson Valley Renegades game on Tuesday, June 11th. Now, I understand the game starts at 6.35. I don't yet know what the ticket cost is going to be because our own Jim M is going to help us with that, and he is not here today, but uh, he knows all the people to talk to over there, so we're going to get him working on that. But let the church office know if you'd like to get a ticket, because, of course, we want to get a block of tickets, if at all possible. Um, and we'll want you to wear your church t-shirt. So again, if you don't have one or yours have gotten really faded, which I doubt, but maybe it's happened, make sure you do that. Next slide. Next Sunday's Pentecost Sunday. Woo! I love Pentecost Sunday. It's like one of my favorites. I mean, I know some people love Christmas, some people love Easter. I love all of those, but man, Pentecost, we're talking about the Holy Spirit coming. That is a big thing to celebrate. And we want to invite you, if you remember, to wear red. If you don't have red, you could wear orange or yellow. Basically, we're going for any kind of colors you might see in the flame. So I suppose if you're talking about a super hot flame, maybe blue would be your color. But anyway, it's a fun way to sort of demonstrate how the spirit is at work among us. If you can remember for next Sunday, that would be awesome. Here's a look at your week ahead. Uh, we've got a board of trustees meeting this Thursday at five on Zoom. Pentecost Sunday worship you heard me talk about and of course uh, the deacons are going to have a meeting next Sunday at about 1 p.m. ish uh, so that's something to be aware of as well next slide Ooh, we've got a fellowship hour luncheon today that includes sandwiches apparently three different kinds of salad how about that I think dips or maybe the type what it was a typo it was meant to be chips and somebody texted me but one of, whether it's dip or chips it's going to be great as well as some dessert so we hope you'll stay for that and before we get to our final hymn i just want to say how wonderful it is that deb was willing to kind of sub kind of last minute uh for for julie who needed to uh, be in philadelphia and gosh, I'm telling you, that offertory, that just was so gorgeous and, and inspiring. I really, really appreciated that. True moment of worship for this worship leader, so thank you. All right, any other announcements? We ready for our closing hymn? I think we are. So our closing hymn is, um, you'll find in your hymnal, or you can also follow along with the words on the screen. You are the seed. It's number 528 in the black hymnal. I invite you to rise in body or spirit to join in singing this hymn.
be seated. Beloved people of God, know this. Even when it seems like God has left you to your own devices, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Trust that God is with you if you need to pause and take a moment to allow God's love to fill your spirit to the brim, don't hesitate to do that. But in the meantime, know that you are called to be Christ's witnesses, people who find ways, not just in what you say, but in all that you do, every decision that you make and every choice that you make, in all that you do to proclaim a different kind of world is not only possible, but to live as though it is already here. A world of love and justice, of peace and compassion, a world in which everyone matters and all belong. And the blessing of the earth maker, the pain bearer, and the life giver go with you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.